Hi there, I'm Anne Marie Mahoney, and this is Belmont Author Spotlight. My guest today is Kevin Cunningham. Many of you know Kevin from his time on the school committee, but Kevin is also an author, and we're very happy to have him here today, primarily to talk about his book, Deep Fake, but we're going to get into some of his other work as well. Kevin, welcome. Very nice to have you. Thanks. Nice to be here, Anne-Marie. Good to catch up with you again. Um, as I mentioned, many of our viewers are going to remember you from your work on the school committee. Yeah. But tell us a little more about yourself, your work, anything else we could share with our viewers. Sure. Uh, I actually grew up in Revere, and, but I went to MIT as my undergraduate, so I'm already immersed in technology and all that kind of stuff. I went to be a science fiction writer, and I found out after a semester there I already learned more than I needed. <laughs> um, and, then, uh, and then I did a lot of theater at that point. That was kind of my artistic expression. And finally, uh, in 1993, I married my wife, Lisa Gibellario, who some Belmonters are also familiar with. And we moved to Belmont in 1995. Okay. And we've lived in Waverly Square since then. And then we had three children. And then we saw how the town was going. And we said, let's contribute. And uh, for myself, I went on to the uh, town meeting in about 2010. And then 2011, I, in several of those years, I ran for school committee. I finally got on the board uh, in 2011. And I ultimately uh, went off the school committee in 2014 in order to help my children get through their high school years. Uh, I'm still on town meeting, uh, and I'm still writing. Meanwhile, I've been doing screenwriting, uh, learning more screenwriting, and, and also technology. Both of those I've been moving forward. All right. Well, thank you. Now that makes a lot more sense to me, the <laughs> yeah. connection between the MIT and the focus of a lot of your writing. Perfect. Sure. Uh, before we get into Deep Fake, which I'm going to hold up here. Here it is. Um, you've done some other work. Uh, you wrote a stage play about little women, mm -hmm. or based on little women, and a thriller screenplay called Witness Elimination Program. Yes. That sounds a little scary. Um, how do you go from adaptation of Louisa May Alcott to movie thrillers to a novel that has kind of a gamer AI vibe? Well, the thing that's common about all my writing, I realize, and also my technology or my uh, contributions to the town, is that I'm kind of first and foremost an analyst. Okay. I, I'm sixth of eight children, a, oh, good, wow. a good Irish Catholic <laughs> all family. Right. <laughs> and so you couldn't be the leader in that kind of context, you, you observed everything. I watched everything that played out and I, and I expressed it in writing. That was kind of the, the genesis of my writing. You know, and I also grew up with Star Trek and Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. But um, so my professional work, as well as my artistic work, is about seeing into the details of things. How do these actually work? How do these people get along together? I'm not really into the superficial entertainment kind of writing. I mean, I try to be entertaining, certainly but there's kind of an intellectual depth or, or an exploration. So when I was, um, when I was at MIT and did, did theater work, I did those kind of plays, exploring different themes of relationships and so forth. And the Little Women version, that was interesting. I, was, uh, I did a lot of, yeah, that's, these are both available on Amazon, by the way. Um, in, uh, when I, I'd already, we'd already had our first child, but I, I'd have been directing, and I said, let me, get, let me go back, get, wet my feet back in the theater world. And uh, Emmanuel College was doing a production of Little Women, right. and they said, we need a director. And so they, they contacted me, and I said, hmm, there are no, uh, let me look at the scripts for this. Because what they really wanted to do is they wanted to redo the Winona Ryder version. You know? And mm -hmm. I said, you can't get the screenplay for that. That's not available to you. So let's find the scripts. And I looked through all the scripts, and they were all rewritten. And I said, I want something that's true to the book. The Little Women book, and um, so I actually wrote it. I said I, I took the, f the whole text of Little Women and I condensed, condensed it. it. Yeah. And so I was doing analytic work of saying, what are the core parts of this? What, I what do I want to retain? So that was an exercise of of literary analysis and synthesis down to a thing. And once I and we that's, we, we produced it. In fact, Lisa was in it. I, she I played Louisa May Alcott. Oh boy! All right. I, I, and it's interesting on Deep Fake because Little Women. I put a frame story around it, which means that I had Louisa Alcott and her uh, editor describing, you know, commissioning her to write the story, and then you had the story. So you had this That's frame right. story around it, which you, you'll recognize from Deep Fake. Yes. But, um, and I played the editor, so Lisa and I played the Louisa May Alcott and her thing. Uh, and so that was, 
that was an exercise in having levels be, be there and, and showing the dimensions of it. And I think um, Greta Gerwig's version later, she mm. also kind of had this, she had Louisa May Alcott as a character in the, in the, uh, in the thing. So we kind of, that, that thread of looking more deeply at something. Deep fake kind of or, originated about the same time. Okay. Um, and with similar instincts, it was, I saw technology coming to the fore and I said, how is this gonna play out? What is, how is this gonna affect the world? Uh, if you don't know, uh, the story of Deepfake is basically a famous actress, kind of over the hill, says, I have to get a new movie out or I'm going to be history, you know, I need to get something new out. And so she tries to produce a new movie and, and she's committed to making it real. She doesn't want to use this AI stuff and CGI. She wants, to use, she wants to use authentic movie making things, which itself is a whole other question. But, um, and, but she's confronted because these teenage hackers use technology currently called deepfake, but it's at the time they hadn't invented that word when I wrote this. This was 25 years ago that I wrote the original draft of this story. That they said, hey, let's make videos of people. And so they choose to do this for reasons in the story. They say, let's take this actress and let's make new movies out of her. So the actress finds herself competing with her own with herself. self. Her younger, more beautiful self, like her, you know, the one that was that everyone was taken with t 20 years earlier. So it's a, it's like the question of who, who are you really? Who's, who's this famous actress? Is it the new videos? And this is not a, this is not a academic question now. No, no, it's not. And I think that as I was reading it, that was sort of the scary part because <laughs> I started to say, well, you know, what's real? As I'm reading this, what's real? And so. Are you, in fact, exploring the nature of reality? You know, what is reality in any given circumstance? Yeah, I like to say that when I when I originally conceived that it was a science fiction story, now, now it's a, now it's contemporary drama. Yes. And in a couple of years, it will be historical fiction. Yes. Because this will this phase will pass. But yes, who are you really? If we can now create, you know, you have these videos. The, the political season that's coming is going to be filled with this. Right. Uh, you have Biden or Trump saying things that they never said and, and looking a certain way and it's all fake. It's all video imagery. So did it really happen or didn't it? And you know, and this, this actress and even movies you see now, you know, say, uh, I think about Castaway has, I remember a scene where they showed Tom Hanks looking over the mountain and looking at the big ocean. And then they showed the making of that scene. He's in a back parking lot looking right, over a right. pile of dirt. <laughs> right. And they fill it all in with all the thing. So right. what is actually real? Right. And it's, when I wrote this, this was bef when, I, when I conceived it, it was before 2001, so it was before 9-11. Mm -hmm. I said, well, first of all, I don't want it to be a, a catastrophic, I don't want it to be the end of the world kind of scenario. AI takes over, blah, blah. I thought a comedy was something new. They, they hadn't really done comedies about this kind of question, so I did that. It's also, there's a family story tucked in the middle right, of it, right. which is interesting. But as far as the reality thing is concerned, so it, I got the sense that you could still distinguish reality, but there were these pockets where you had this kind of illusion. And one of the themes of the, is one of the hackers is in, actually in love with this actress, but he's in love with her image. Right. He's hardly ever met her. So, he's, so this whole question of what does he really love? Um, is, is kind of th spread through the piece. And nowadays, by now, I feel like many people, maybe all of us, it's hard to know, we're, we're wrapped in this fictional world. There's whole parts of the country that have a framework for the world that I say, that's not even true. That's not based in reality. And, and when do you ground yourself in reality? That's a, that's a very important question now. And I only touch peripherally in the book on that. But I think it, it puts you into the space of, set, of wondering, you know, where, where does the real leave off and the fake and the, the created um, come in? Yeah. And I think when you say there are layers, there are layers <laughs> to your characters and there's layers to to the plot or to how the whole thing unfolds. Right, the storytelling. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. And I did that in the most recent draft, uh, part of it. There's always this question, yeah, there's scenes, it was originally written as a screenplay. Okay. So. And you can get that sense, I think, from reading it because you are very character 
kind of dialogue based. Yeah. And so you do move along with it, but in the moving along, you do find yourself kind of stopping saying, well, wait a minute, let me backtrack here for a minute. And what did he say and what did he do? You know, it- What it, reality it constant, man? Exactly, there's exactly. A, there's a common little trope in it where you're watching, you're reading something and it goes on and then it ends and you realize, oh, that was a movie. I just, that was just a movie I was watching and now this other thing. And in fact, the whole story, there's this frame story in this book. I didn't have this frame story before. It used to just be that. But the frame story is the famous actress says, I'm going to start my new career. And, she, and her husband gives her this video to watch. And the bulk of the story is the video. Right. So everything you're seeing is, in, in fact, an artifact, an artifact itself, just like the whole book. Right. is an artifact. Right. So yeah, you, you go in through these levels. That actually was an issue with the first readers. Okay. Uh, there was a long, long ago we had a kind of a reading of the screenplay and it kind of broke into two camps. One was, oh, this is really cool. This is like uh, Philip K. Dick or Jorge Borges. Like there's these kind of like science fiction-y kind of mm. intertwined things. What's the nature of reality? And other people said, I, I can't tell what level of reality I'm in. It's really disappointing. I, I don't know, I can't tell, it's too confusing. I tried to address a lot of that, but I'm sure that some readers will still find it a little unclear where exactly, what level of reality am I in? But I feel like that, that's part of the point of the book to some extent. Right, oh it is, absolutely. Yeah, you know, like where, yes. what is real? And it, so I think that it, it's successful in that sense, but I can see some readers maybe being a little confused, but I think with yeah. the proper framing, I think I've addressed I think that. what keeps you a little grounded, or at least what periodically reins you back in, is what you mentioned earlier, which is the very genuine interpersonal relationships. So the husband and the wife, the, the father and the son, the mother and the son, that keeps you grounded in some respects in reality, but then it kind of spins <laughs> off yep. from there. It's like, hold on to your seat. Yeah, I, I, to me, the core of the story is the family story that's in there. The, the, the screen actress having this thing is a peripheral story to me, but when you're pitching this to Hollywood, or you know, when I'm sending my script around, I have to lead with the actress, because that's, the, that's, that's the high the concept, exactly. that's the big concept. But to me, the heart of the story is, is about the boy, and how does he reconcile this love of a, of a phantasm, that was the original title, phantasm, mm -hmm. but, um, and to me, it also this is one of those other themes that cuts to, cuts right to the the heart of what why it's relevant now, which is that where do you find love in a in a world of images? Right. You know, when I if I relate to you through texting or through an avatar, and you know, two years from now, I can be talking to you. I can be off golfing, and you can be having ta a conversation with my avatar, which is you know embodied a lot of me. Where is where is love there? What, where is our connection? Where is the human connection? Right. And that I tried to raise those questions, and I, and I I'm hopeful about it. And so in the story, without giving away the ending, I try to resolve that in favor of um, people actually interacting with each other is is more important than the technological entertainment. And didn't we in fact experience some of that during COVID, when everything, all of our relationships were at a distance on technology. We were all on Zoom, mm -hmm. you know, or we were all doing whatever we were doing, but we were never in person. Right. You know, and, and what happened to our interpersonal relationships as a result of that. And even noticing, if I, my impression at the time was they have a little less reality. Some, there's some way, yes. when, you're, when, you're, when you're going through the medium of Zoom or whatever, there's a, some kind of remoteness, not just emotional remoteness, but almost ideational. Their reality is somehow slightly less. They're 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 equal to Brad Pitt in a movie. Like <laughs> right, there's some yes, there's yes. some equivalence when you're looking at a screen, as opposed to this is the person that I wake up with every day, or I I have a meal with, and I'm and I'm talking to, and I and I can notice the expressions on their face, and it's a it, you're right exactly. COVID was a was a kind of a an example of the of the distancing that happens due to technology. Right. Right. Because I know, again, even the simple Zoom stuff, a lot of us, and I'm one person who did it, always had fake backgrounds. You know, I mm -hmm. didn't want people inside my house, uh, I see. essentially. And so you could place yourself, as you say, anywhere. You know, I had my winter background, my summer background, you know, my library background, whatever. And each person was doing that. And so where were we for real? And I had the opposite. 
I had the opposite instinct, which is that I want it to show what's really behind me because I want to be more authentic. Or I want it, I want it to be as least, as minimal uh, technological distance between me and you. So I'm going to show you my dirt, my messy bookshelves, and I'm going to show you how I look, and I'll have my hair on, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, I. I wanted it, I, I kind of strove to make it be authentic. You know, there's a little part of me that says, oh, maybe I should clean up my bookshelves or order them. And then there's a part of me that says, they have, that's the way they that's are. The way so, is. you know, that's, I'm trying to interact with a person, not with... Their background. The, yeah, their background. But anyway, the right. back, but backgrounds are also fun. So there's, there's all of well, that. Well, that was it. I think yeah. some of us were having fun. Some of us were protecting our privacy. You know, there were right. a lot of reasons for, right. for doing what we did. I had him. I had a, I read all kinds of things. I'm, I'm into all genres of, of literature and other stuff. So, but I happened to have a book about Nazi Germany on my shelf. And somebody said, you can't, you shouldn't have that because that, that will make your, your right wing and you're your a fascist or whatever, like whatever they would say. Oh, and so that was a case where I had to kind of control my image. The right. notion of controlling your image has always been here. We've always like, how do, I, how do I show up to other people? I have to dress a certain way, I have to make up or whatever. I have to talk a certain way. Now, that's all there is, is the image. And um, so it's a really interesting question about how do, you, how do you find authenticity when everything is a gesture to image? I, you know, I have a daughter, I have two teen daughters, or they're not teens anymore. In fact, one of them just turned 21. Um, in, in the eighth grade or the ninth grade, it's all about how you're coming across. Oh, yes, yes. And it's damaging. Three daughters. Yeah, yes, and they, and like, because they can, they don't know who they really, truly are. I mean, boys to a lesser extent, but I find girls in particular have this, this pack thing that happens, and, and they're trying to figure out who am I truly, and can I be true to that, or will I be, will I be bullied or, or talked badly about? Will I be eliminated from the group? Mm. So these themes play out. Who... What is your identity it really does play out in, in all kinds of ways, more so today right, right. than ever. And I found the interaction of the main character, Andy, um, and his so-called friends, who really struck me as seventh grade bullies. <laughs> you know, their whole role was to be obnoxious teenagers. And I will say it annoyed me, but that's a compliment in that you are successful in portraying that. They made me crazy. Um, so that, again, is the, uh, the very base level human interaction and emotion layered into this high tech stuff. Yeah, I hope, I hope I've observed well the interactions of real people. Interestingly, that bullying one of them, who's like the nemesis yes, of the character, well, yes. you know, the way that it ends up though, is that there's a layer beneath that that he was yes. trying to he was trying yes. to establish his friendship, and he was actually trying to help his friend move on from his, you know, childish love of this illusion. So he was bullying even with a purpose. But I totally get what you're saying. He he is. I absolutely present him as someone who's like not respecting Andy and just saying, you know, that's ridiculous. Move on. Like yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Captured that. I hope. So I didn't realize when I was reading it that you had actually written this quite a while ago. So, the first draft, yeah. The, uh, I've, I've updated it. Okay, yeah. so talk a little bit about the technology. I mean, I, this means nothing to me. You sure. know, I'm lucky I can collect my email most mm -hmm. days. So a, a lot of the, the techno stuff in there was way beyond what I could even imagine. Uh -huh. So is, it, is that real or is it fake? You know, are you basing this on real technological stuff that's out there, or are you fantasizing a little bit? Well, that's interesting. Again, because when I wrote the first draft, it was imagined. It was, this is, we're going to get to here eventually, but it was imagined. When the writer's strike happened, the mm. WGA, Writers Guild of America, screenwriters, uh, happened in 2023, last year, I said... I've written about this. There's even a strike in the book, right? Is that, yeah, There's there a strike. Is, yes. I had predicted that because of earlier uh, WGA strikes. Um, so I need to get this book out now. So I had to update it, and I said, let, let me think about this. What kind of movies would people be making? And I, I, I made it all current. So the technology in it is current. In fact, since I did the revision in the middle of last year, uh, then, uh, was it then? ChatGPT came out. Okay. and other technologies that are chatbots and stuff right. like that. I feel like the technology is almost not up to date enough. 
Right. Like it's actually passed. Like I talk about deep fake and deep fake is a little old hat almost right mm. now. So what I would say is that the technology is actually already present. It's not even, there's, there's no visioning of the future anymore. Mm. It's just that it's, the technology is all there. So if you're not caught up with it, uh, that, that, that is an issue about entry <laughs> to the book, right? Like some people, yeah. they read it and they hit this part about um, video gaming and stuff like that. And I've, I think that it's actually, it turns out that true video gamers or people who use modern technology will say, oh yeah, we used to use that, but we don't use that anymore. And other people will say, oh, that's, techno that's too com you know, complex technology. I don't know if I can get into that. Right. But um, it is accurate to, to now. Okay. Yeah. So in, in that space of time, as you rewrote it, um, did you change the ending at all? You know, did, did any parts of this evolve in a different way, maybe from the way you originally conceived it? There were parts where I explained the technology more, okay. and I reduced those. Um, I would say that the core idea has not changed, okay. because the core idea is the resolution of the conundrum, how do you find authenticity? in a world of technology. And so, uh, and, and the fact that underlying it is a, is a kind of a ultimate hope that people are good and that they'll help each other ultimately and they'll, and they'll find their good part. And that, that, I didn't want to change that at all. Right. The one addition I guess I, you could say is that, and it's not even a plot change, the, the core story ends the same, but there is a kind of an afterword where the actress adopts the technology going forward. Says, let, let yes, me, let me, yes. not, she says co-opt it, but let me, let me participate in it so th as opposed to be at the, event, at the effect of it. So it was kind of about taking possession, her own ownership of her future. Mm. Um, and that was an additional piece. But again, it's in that kind of optimistic framework of let's, let's not be victims of technology, let's drive forward with technology as, as, a, as an asset. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, being a little older and really loving older movies, <laughs> um, how did you choose the movies that you manipulated? So you've got Humphrey Bogart and you've got Breakfast at Tiffany's, and how did you pick those particular movies, given, again, given your audience or your potential audience? Right. So the point is, uh, in the book, the things that the teenage hackers use are not just, they don't take the most recent movies, they take classic movies. Um, because... This was an issue, this, again, with my earliest readers, uh, some, some people said, uh, people would, kids wouldn't do this. They wouldn't, these kids wouldn't be talking about Bogart movies. They wouldn't be talking about Breakfast at Tiffany's and all that kind of stuff. And I, and I said, you know, my kids watch Netflix and they're watching Seinfeld and they're watching Grey's Anatomy. Like, they're not watching, they also watch the most recent, but the point is that they're, there's always been young people engaged with the, tech, with the world of the past. Right. And so that's first of all. As far as the specific movies, I'm a big Bogart fan. I used to go to the Brattle all the time oh, and yeah. see his movies. I would go see you know, two or three shows kind of thing or at the Harvard Square Theater when it was there. Um, so I'm immersed in Bogart and I wanted him to be a, a lead a character, character in the middle right. of it. And then you had Lauren Bacall and Bogart. So, you, so Bacall replaces, is replaced by the actress by these boys using deep fake technology. Now, as far as the other movies are concerned, I wouldn't necessarily have chosen Breakfast at Tiffany's nowadays because okay. it does have issues. That was a place that I did rewrite slightly because it has, has kind of racist tropes in it and it has like feminine, you know, uh, it, it was originally even that Holly was a prostitute in that movie, in right, the book. Right, yeah. But the movie kind of softened it, but it still is kind of, I don't want to say misogynistic is too strong, but it's, it isn't necessarily the movie I picked, but I had already constructed it, and so instead of changing it out, I wrote around it, and I had the boy say, you know what, this isn't really a good choice. Yeah. Um, there's a third one that isn't, that's in there, it's Dear Brigitte, which is a movie with um, right. Jimmy Stewart, and it has, um, uh, what's her name, um, Bridget Bardot, mm. and it's about a boy who's in love with a movie star. So I chose it for thematic reasons. Right. Um, those, so those kind of are different. I like the threading. This is one of the things that makes the movie difficult to classify. What is its genre? Right, and that actually is one of my questions here, yeah, the, in genre and, and audience, because you're right, it's not, um, uh, what do I want? Um, oh God, I'm blanking. It's not, 
It's, it's not, not science fiction. It's not strictly science fiction. No. I mean, it is kind of, it's, 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 it's a certain a kind. It's not a story. It's not a coming of age story. It's not, you know, there's so many different genres out there, but it's none of the above. It is a family story. It's a drama. Yes. It's a comedy. It's a satire. At a certain point, I said, you know what? I have so many references to other things that I kind of have to classify it as a satire or a parody to protect myself for copyright reasons. Yeah, true. Because, yes, yes. you know, if you, if uh, there was a case where, um, uh, Scarlett Johansson, somebody had written a novel in, in Europe and they said, this character looked like Scarlett Johansson. That's all they said. And then yeah. the rest of it was just the character. Yeah. S Scarlett's people sued and won oh, that you can't, you know, you, this is not appropriate. She has the control of her character. Yeah. I was very aware, and this, you, the subtitle, right, is A Tale of Love and Copyright. Y yes. I'm very aware of the copyright issues that are introduced inside the story by the boys using these things and they, that, that's one of the reasons the FBI is, tra is tracking him down, right? Is because he's using... It's the copyright. Yeah, it's the copyright. Using the images. He used right. to have and have not and like then the FBI is going after him. But I'm also aware that me writing this book is referencing to have and have not or other people. Originally I had written it with an actual movie star in mind okay. and I got rid of all of that, all of that thing, all the traces of that and so this is a fictional is movie fictional star. Vivian. But it was... Originally, I thought it was an in, I thought it was clever to have based it on a real person, another layer of the thing. Mm. But I kind of um, I, I felt like I had to protect myself for I, <laughs> right. intellectual property <laughs> He'd be reasons. In jail. Yeah, exactly. Right. That would be that would be that would be the irony of the <laughs> exactly of the book. right. <laughs> I love it. Um, also, I found more towards well, actually bracketed the beginning and then also the end. You do have these very sort of tender moments between. Andy, the main character, and the girl across the alley, you know, his sort yes. of pseudo girlfriend, Laura. And in the end, it's like, okay, but what about Laura? And she does come back in yes, a little bit at the end, and I don't in. want to spoil it. So I'm just right. going to say that there is this little bracketing again back Everything to your Everything connects layers. back in, yeah. Right. In fact, if I were to rewrite this as a script now, so I had a script and then I adapted it into a novel. If I were to rewrite a script, I would pull Laura's character out more and have her be yes. more of a presence. Yes, that and, would be awesome. Yeah. That would be good. I would like that. Yeah, <laughs> good. good idea. <laughs> All right. Um, this is excellent. This is, our time has, has almost gone by. Mm -hmm. um, fascinating reading. So far, audience, once again, deep fake. Uh, check it out. As we said, it doesn't fit any particular category. <laughs> so everyone is going to find something in this book that they can relate to. Um, Kevin, fascinating. Now, what's, what's coming up next for you? What's your next project? So I have a couple of projects. One is um, I wrote these set of short stories when I was, uh, science fiction short stories, when I was like um, 16. And I'm going to package these and just explain what I learned by writing each story. So, so it's a kind of a memoir about a writer coming to learn th new things by writing these stories. Right. Another thing I have is a story kind of based on Belmont, <laughs> <laughs> where a, a woke New England town yeah. votes in town meeting to give their land back to the Native American tribe from right. which it was taken. Right. It's a comedy or a satire. And they proceed to, um, uh, I'm not going to give away a lot of the details, but they proceed basically to unwittingly, in spite of themselves, still try to hurt the native tribe. <laughs> like they give the land to them and then they start saying, well, we'll sell it to us cheap, you know, and let's, we'll build a casino. Like they start to abuse the natives, even having in, in, in their best of interest giving it over to them. So it's, a, it's like a satire of government and, um, right. and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll look forward to sure. that for sure. And we'll be picking out the landmarks in Belmont <laughs> as we read it. Uh-oh, watch out. It will be fictionalized. <laughs> All right. Wonderful to have you here. Yeah. Thank you for coming. A um, lot of good, good information and certainly an entertaining book. Thank you so for So I invite me. my audience to partake. All right. Um, this has been Belmont Author Spotlight. I'm Anne-Marie Mahoney. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to our next author. Thanks so much. Major funding for the Belmont Media Center is paid by franchise fees from Comcast, Verizon, provided through the town of Belmont. 
Additional support is provided by our business and community sponsors, including Russian School of Mathematics and Man, Maunderer Design, Tamsin Kaplan, Alden Lock and Security, Nursing on Demand. Drink Dish and Craft Beer Cellar. And by Bethel Temple Center, Belmont Chinese American Association, National Association of Armenian Studies and Research. And by you. Thank you. Support live and local TV coverage of public meetings, school events, town activities, and hyper-local news by donating to BMC at belmontmedia.org slash donate.